In this week's update, still a market with plenty of disbelievers. New all-time US highs and sectors that are leading. My name is Gary Davis and as always this is general advice only. And please remember to subscribe and like the video. All right, let's start with just a bit of overall perspective as usual. What's really apparent in the last um, few weeks, and I guess it's there all the time, but there are still so many people that are negative, commentators, um, the, the general investing herd, so many people are still negative and are pointing at the continued rise of the US market in particular and, uh, and talking about valuations. And it seems to have gone up a, another notch in the last couple of weeks. But the reality is that there are still quite elevated cash levels on the sidelines, and that is a consequence of how people are thinking about the market. The VIX index is still at 22, which is pretty high. And that is really a validation of how people are thinking. The VIX index is an indication of how, to what degree people are buying put insurance to protect their portfolios. And that's still quite elevated. And let's just have a, a quick look. Um, sorry, just let me get to the right screen. Okay, there's the VIX index. So we're looking at this over the last uh, 12 months, and you can see this area to the left here below 20, from 20 down to say 12. That is the normal level that the VIX would be at when markets are uh, just running along normally and people aren't overly fearful. Then of course we got the massive spike in February and March, which went up to 80. And we've had a decline back since then, and this is tracing out a pretty normal sort of pattern. But you can see where we are. We're at 22 and a half still. And 22 and a half on a long term view is still quite elevated. So there is still quite a degree of fear in the market, despite what the indices are doing. And you'll see in a min minute just how dramatic that is. So from my perspective, the market can't be measured in historical terms when we're in an environment of negative real interest rates, um, just extraordinary stimulus. So many things have changed. Uh, but look, in any case, as I've been saying repeatedly for a long, long time, most people don't trade the index unless you've got your money parked in a fund somewhere that tracks the index. So forget what the index is doing because we've got stocks that are outperforming the index by an absolute country mile, and then we've got other stocks that are, that are lagging very, very badly. So my approach has always been just to trade the enduring growth stocks, the ones where the futures look simply stunning and the share prices are going up. I mean, you know, it, investing doesn't need to be any more complicated than that. So I'd really encourage everyone not to be stuck with a negative mindset, worried about the excessive valuations, worried about the prices that have been going up at, uh, at a seemingly unsustainable rate, and of still clinging to a strategy that was appropriate 10 or 20 or 30 years ago. So many funds these days are being run like life is normal. But, you know, life is not normal. Just think about international travel or lack of it. Think about the process of buying online. It's dramatically brought forward trends of social behavior that were always going to happen anyway. It's just they were going to happen a lot more slowly. How many small businesses in Australia, and particularly in Victoria, will never reopen? And what that does to personal psychologies and then the ripple effect through the whole country. You know, life is not going back to normal. Think about the moves into digital banking and, and digital finance in general. So many people are doing things differently to the way that they used to do them. And then think about the businesses that will benefit from these changes, many of which are never going back to how they were. <clears throat> and then, of course, think about the businesses that are disadvantaged. So it's no wonder that we're getting up, we're, we're seeing open up this incredible divergence between businesses that are doing outrageously well and businesses that are doing poorly. And it's probably going to be sustained. So to think that the investing approach 
doesn't need to shift significantly is just not being realistic. So that's really the strong point that I want to make this week, that you've got to be open minded to doing things differently because there is just an amazing array of opportunities out there. I've never been so excited and so bullish about the next five years as I am now looking at so many Australian stocks. Um, you don't need to go to America to, uh, to find them, although there are uh, plenty of amazing opportunities there, but there's plenty in Australia as well. So let's look at the American stocks. Um, the S&P rose uh, another 0.7% for the week, so that's two weeks in a row, and it hit new record closing highs. And that's extraordinary to think that that occurs just five months after the crash. You know, back in March, late March, if you'd said the S&P was going to be hitting new all-time highs by August, um, you, you know, you would have been uh, locked up, I'm sure. When we look at the breadth of the market, there's still a lot of commentary out there that this is a market being led by the big tech stocks, by the FANG stocks. It's not true. In fact, in, in recent uh, weeks, they've actually been lagging relative to some of these other sectors. You look at transports, which is obviously a, a very key component of the economy. The transports, not only the results, but the price trends are, um, are showing really good signs. Um, you look at consumer discretionary, which is XLY. It's going beautifully in the States. We've just come through reporting season and the results have been really solid. The share prices are not going up on speculation. They're going up on the basis of good growth and good results. So this is not just a story about big tech. And then in addition, we've got the Russell 2000, which reflects a large part of the uh, small cap market in, in the US. And that's demonstrating some really good underlying strength as well. So this is not a market where the indices are going up because of a handful of large tech stocks. It's just not true. It's a very convenient uh, narrative that some of the media is running, but it's just not factual. At the US dollar, uh, we saw a little bit of a bounce during the week. Uh, it had got quite oversold, and so to get these periodic bounces is normal. But quite clearly, the US uh, dollar has broken down now in terms of trend, and the the direction at the moment certainly is is down to the downside. And the 10 year yield um, got up to 0.71 uh, inexplicably, not quite sure what that was about, but it started to ease back and was uh, sitting at 0.66 at the end of the week. So let's take a look at some charts. We'll start with the S&P first of all, and this was the previous all time high at uh, it was 33.93 and we close just a tick above it, uh, just four points above it at 33.97. But the key things to note here, if you look at the moving averages, the red line is the 200 day, the blue line is the 50 day, and the, and the, um, the green line is the 20 day. Look at the alignment, particularly of the 20 day and the 50 day. You can't argue with the strength of the trend. These Moving averages are all stacked up nicely as they should be in an uptrend. And there's absolutely no reason to suspect that the S&P index, albeit will get little periods of consolidation like we saw in, in June, um, but the direction is up. It's overwhelmingly up. And uh, we're certainly um, back into a cyclical bull market as part of an overall um, uh, secular bull market. Let's look at some of the other indices. So there's the NASDAQ. Now there's the February highs. Just look at where the NASDAQ is, which is really your growth stocks. This is the growth leaders, and it's not just big technology. There's an awful lot of um, stocks that are, um, that are listed on the NASDAQ that are contributing to that incredible outperformance. And look at the outperformance relative to the S&P down in this bottom pane down here. It's absolutely killing the general market. Let's look at the Russell 2000. Now, it's not doing as well as the others, but it's not underperforming. Look at the performance against the S&P. It is slightly better than it was in March, but at least it is in line. Now, if we were in the process of forming a major top in the market, 
I can assure you the, the small caps would not be outperforming the general market. So that, that is telling you that the, the, the Russell 2000 is going as well as Microsoft and Apple and all those other stocks because they're, they're comprising the index. So the small caps are telling us that there is tremendous breadth in the US market. If we look at the transports, as I said, we've just gone through reporting season and reporting season confirms the price trend. Look at the rebound in the transportation stocks, particularly trucking and delivery services like FedEx and UPS. Incredible results that are just absolutely beating the socks off what the market expected. And we're back now almost to new, um, uh, to the, the old highs. Look at the outperformance of the transports relative to the S&P, this pain here. It's really, really strong and it's strong for a reason. Look at the, the moving averages, the, the 20 day and the 50 day, look at how they're aligned and look at where the price is in relation to the moving average. Let's have a look at home builders, another incredibly um, strong sector that's broken out. And it's being driven by strong data. If you, if you look at new home sales, you look at a whole lot of metrics in the housing area, it's very, very strong. And the prices are going up accordingly. They're not going up on speculation. So this is all time highs in American home building. And look at the performance relative to the S&P. It's absolutely killing it. So why would you invest in an overall index when you can just cherry pick the part of the market that's doing well and leave alone the part of the market that's not? It's, it's not a difficult process. Okay, while I'm here, let's just have a look at the US dollar. And you can see here that we've had a, um, a breakdown of, uh, of the US dollar, and we've been looking at this now for a few weeks. So we're between um, this support level, which should now form as a resistance level, around about the 94 and a half. And the next point of support comes in at about 89 and a half. And it's still quite a quite a way away because the, the US dollar index finished at 93 and a quarter. So that's still another good five percentage points, uh, four or five percentage points until we get to support. So clearly the US dollar uh, has probably got more downside in it yet. And that's obviously going to feed through in a positive way to uh, to gold. The Australian dollar is obviously going in the opposite direction, partly because of the US dollar, but partly because we're still seeing this incredible strength in iron ore, which is holding up above $120 a tonne. So that's certainly contributing to, um, to the strength in the, um, in the Australian currency. And one can only imagine where we would be, not only in terms of currency, but also as an economy, if we didn't have a very, very buoyant iron ore price at the moment, we'd be in all sorts of strife. Just while I'm here, let's just look at the ASX 200 index. So you can see dramatically underperforming the US market in terms of the at the index level. You know, it's, it's nowhere near the February highs. And in the recent um, couple of months, it's effectively gone nowhere. And of course, that's largely because of the underperformance from the banks and the banks are underperforming for a very good reason. And there's a lot of other stocks as well, a lot of industrial stocks, a lot of finance stocks that are basically facing headwinds for many, many years. And they're going to hold the Australian market back significantly. But within that, there are tremendous opportunities. So let's have a look at the Australian market. So 71 and a half was where the Australian dollar finished on Friday. Our index ended up losing 0.2 of a percent, so effectively flat on the week. But it's really the small caps. That's the story of the Australian market. It's the small caps that are clearly outperforming. And in those small caps, it's technology in so many forms. It's miners, it's healthcare, it's telecoms, it's renewable energy. There are so many exciting possibilities in Australia. In fact, not possibilities, so many exciting unfolding stories where you can see absolutely multi-bagger potential for many, many years to come. 
Let's move on to precious metals. Um, gold was down $5 on the week, finishing at 1940, and that is largely because of the little bit of strength in the US dollar. Now we're still tracing out an ABC pattern here in precious metals, which is pretty normal. So we're, we're in a, an overall bull market. It's a very powerful bull market, but we're getting a correction. And we're getting a correction because the market had got to a very extreme level of, uh, of overbought. And so this is normal, it's healthy, and it may continue for a few more weeks yet. When we look at the chart, you'll see there are support levels at 1911, at 1840, and then at 1791. I severely doubt that the last one is, um, is going to get uh, approached, but who knows? Now, if you look at some of the dynamics around the precious metals industry, jewellery is, uh, jewellery demand is the largest, and typically it's been around about 50% of total demand. But of late, because of COVID, um, jewellery demand has declined, particularly in China, particularly in, um, uh, in India, which are two of the bigger consumers. Um, and also to a bit of a degree in America as well. But that decline in demand for jewellery has been absolutely overwhelmed by the continuing robust investment buying that we're seeing, uh, and you can see it in the numbers, in, um, in GLD, which is the world's biggest ETF that, um, that reflects the gold price. There is still massive accumulation um, through GLD, and we'll uh, we'll look at an update on those numbers. I've been uh, putting that together for the last uh, six months or so, so we'll do an update on that. And if we look at precious metal stocks, um, GDX is slightly higher. It's still underperforming where it should be relative to the gold price. Uh, but one of the reasons for that is that whilst the gold price went up a lot and therefore the potential profitability for the gold miners uh, is, is really going through the roof. Outside of Australia, an awful lot of gold mines actually were shut down because of COVID. And so production got cut, which pushed costs up. So the second quarter results are nowhere near as good as the, the gold price would indicate. But that's coming because those gold miners have now resumed full production. So I expect to see Q3 and Q4 um, on a global basis to be extremely strong. And once investors in the gold stocks start to see that coming through, then I think you're going to see a real real surge in, um, in gold mining stocks. So stocks still have a lot of catching up to do. We'll take a look at that in a minute. But I just wanted to show you this. This is the GLD Holdings. So there was, there was the previous all-time high in September of 2011. There were 42 million ounces held in, um, in GLD. That was, um, that was the all-time high and still remains the high. But that was really um, an incredible period. We, you know, we'd had a decade-long uh, bull market in, um, in gold, and so a lot of people were piling into GLD. But look where it fell to during the... Um, during the ex extreme bear market that we had in gold. By January of 2016, that had halved. So nearly half the money had come out of being invested in, um, in gold via GLD. And then it effectively did nothing through October. And, but then as we got into this year, it had started to move up again. So we were into the, the bull market, but it wasn't really on everybody's radar at that stage. But the fear around the last six months has really brought that up dramatically. Look at the dramatic surge um, through to the middle of the year, and it's still it's still going. It's not even though we've got economies opening up again, we've still got significant money still rolling into GLD. So there's been another um, what's that 1.7 uh, million ounces. Of, uh, of buying has gone into GLD. Let's look at the price charts. So we'll start first of all with gold on a weekly basis. So this was the prior highs in 2011. This bull market in gold started uh, in around about April, May of 2019. The actual breakout occurred in June. 
So it's about we're about 14 months in. Now we were tracking along in a very nice channel. We had a little bit of a one or two week drop out of that channel um, occurred in March. That was really a liquidity driven event um, with the plunge in stock markets around the world. It was it was a, a lot of margin calls set off, and when that happens, anything that's liquid is is sold to meet those margin calls. And so gold got hit for a week or two, but then it very quickly came back into the channel and then accelerated. So it busted out of that channel in July, so basically a month ago, and um, uh, zipped up to 2077 before retracing back to the breakout zone. So this is all very technical, all very normal, and um, and it's all looking pretty pretty good at the moment, I must say. We dipped under it for less than one day. That move under that support level really only lasted for about 10 or 12 hours. Um, and then the support level has, um, has reasserted itself. So there's certainly support at 1912. The next level that I would look at would be this level at 1840, which is uh, the first Fibonacci retracement level from the March lows. Um, and then uh, the next level that would come in would be uh, just under 1800, which is the, the peak that we had here in October of 2012. So they're the three levels. First one there, second one here, and there's the third one. So there'd be the three levels to look at for um, for gold. If we look at it on a uh, daily basis, you can see really we had one, one sharp sell off on Wednesday, but other than that, um, we pretty much just held ground. Silver is outperforming uh, gold as it needed to do because it was just ridiculously oversold in March. And so it's still doing better than gold and still playing catch up. Turning now to GDX. So this is a weekly chart. If we go back to the peak in 2011, so gold miners were trading via GDX up at $66. If you look at where we are now, we broke out of this uh, resistance level that occurred in April. We moved up, we retested the breakout, much as in the same sort of fashion that we're seeing with gold at the moment. And then there's been a big surge since then. Now, as I said on the last slide, gold stocks are still undervalued relative to where they should be. And I think we'll see that uh, catch up progressively unfold in coming weeks and months because the market is looking forward. It will start to look forward. It knows now that the gold mines around the world are opening up again and the Q3 and Q4 results are going to be simply stunning. And so that's going to start to be priced into um, to gold stocks fairly soon. All right, let's look at other commodities. Copper was higher to $2.96. Um, a little bit of currency effect there, obviously, with the US dollar, but this was a, a move that really is showing confidence in the, um, the rebound in the global economy. Crude oil also a little bit stronger to, uh, to $42. There's the, the spot copper chart. So we certainly set a new all-time high uh, or a new short-term high. Anyway, I shouldn't say all-time high. So just wrapping it up, my final thoughts. Um, I, look, I know that these gains are confusing. They're illogical because I, you know, I get questions all the time via portfolio analyst and directly. And I know a lot of people are scratching their head and wondering you know, how long it can, can continue on. But my experience in the market has been to trade it as it is. Um, the successful approach has been to trade what you see and not what you think should be. And that approach is working and it's working very well. So my strong advice would be just to follow the macro, macro trends, ignore the rest, ignore the media, ignore the voices in your head that are telling you that it's all illogical and it shouldn't be happening. The fact is that the market is rewarding highly probable future growth, where the perception is, and in most cases a reality, that's what the US reporting season is now telling us. And also in Australia, the, the stocks, the high growth stocks that have reported are reporting blowout results. 
you, know, you look at some of the results for um, online stocks like Kogan and JB Hi-Fi, they were tremendous results by any metric. So the market is rewarding those highly probable future earning streams and future growth. So go with it. The market is not stressing about the current high valuations. It's just looking at where these businesses are going. Portfolio analysts this week, there's just opportunities everywhere. It's the most exciting period. I've been in the market 33 years. It's the most exciting period I've ever been in. And um, my, uh, my overwhelming biggest problem at the moment is I keep running out of cash to take the opportunities. So that's it for this week. There's my website address, which contains more information about the services. And also there's my email address if anyone wants to contact me directly. So that's it for this week. Cheers.